Hello and welcome. This is uh, Eric Adenge from Change Media. And today I'd like to talk about what we call the exposure triangle, which is, which is basically what you need to do to take a photo. A photo is an exposure. A photo is light having been allowed to get into the camera sensor. The camera sensor is right behind that um, reflex mirror so whenever you take a photo it gets out of the way for the light to hit um, the sensor so before you take a photograph you need to make some adjustments and those adjustments are summarized by what is known as the exposure triangle so the exposure triangle is the basic rule that helps you to uh, manipulate your camera before you take any photos and the triangle has three components. The first one is the shutter speed. And as I said earlier, I prefer to use the touch screens when I'm working with this particular model. I find it a bit more easier than to go around the other way. So when you press your Q here, which is the quick selection uh, button, you can then get to your shutter speed. So shutter speed is measured to the fraction of a second. Um, shutter speed is sort of a set of blades that opens and closes to allow light to get to the sensor. So the higher the shutter speed, like for example one over 1000, and if you hit the shutter, you can tell that it's quite fast. The faster the shutter speed, the less the light you get into the camera. I'll just take that down again. The slower the shutter speed, this is one over 25th of a second, and you can tell you know, by the time it takes to open and close. The slower the shutter speed, the more the light that you get into a camera. We're not seeing much now because we're a little bit in a dark place. So that's the first member um, of the exposure triangle, that is the shutter speed. The next one here is the aperture. And the aperture is the actual opening that allows light into the camera. The aperture is similar to your eye's um, pupil. If you look at a human eye, there's a smaller black part that is the pupil. Then you have the slightly larger one, which is the iris. So the pupil is what allows in light. In this case, it is the aperture. The iris is what controls the aperture. So we measure or rather aperture is measured in f stops and uh, for this particular camera the widest aperture is 3.5 so that's a very wide aperture um, you take a picture there should be more light than if you do the same at a higher f stop this camera's smallest f stop is f22 so at f22 we have less light than at f 3.5 the tricky thing about f-stop numbers is that they are counterintuitive. So the higher the f-stop number, the smaller the aperture. The lower the f-stop number, like f3.5, the larger um, the aperture. And that's basically because of the physics calculations involved, but it can be a bit confusing. So the lower the f-stop number, the bigger the aperture. The higher the f-stop number, the smaller the aperture. And lastly, here you have the ISO. We have the ISO. Now, in contrast to the shutter speed and the aperture, um, the ISO adjusts the sensitivity of the camera to light. The first two adjust the amount of light getting into the camera, but the ISO adjusts the sensitivity of the camera itself to light. So normally it is recommended that you don't touch your ISO first because you're basically making the camera to work harder and that has its own problems because it introduces what we call noise into your pictures or grain. Your picture becomes grainy. So it is a useful feature when you have low light conditions but it is one that you should only adjust um, after you've tried everything else. Like if you have your widest aperture or you've tried or you don't have um, external lights, then you can use your ISO. 
but it is a very useful tool to have um, in cameras. So ISO 100 is the lowest ISO setting on this camera and uh, it can go um, all the way up to ISO um, 128, 12,800. And of course you have an auto uh, version there as well where you can adjust other things and auto will take care of itself. So a lot of photographers um, usually recommend that if you're doing any ISO settings that uh, you shouldn't go you know, beyond 1600 or else you start having a lot of grain in your photo. So first use the other option, options. Second, try and see if you can use um, external lights um, and then you can resort to adjusting your ISO. Something else that I would like to share about the exposure triangle or the measurements that I've just mentioned is that whereas your shutter speed adjusts the light coming into the camera, and I said earlier, the faster the shutter speed, the less the light, the lower the shutter speed, the more the light. The other creative um, characteristic that this shutter speed does is that if you are taking uh, photographs of motion, for example, safari rally cars or animals, then you need to use higher shutter speed because it is able to freeze motion. So that is a very important other feature uh, of the shutter speed in addition to just adding or reducing light. So to take pictures of moving objects, you need a higher shutter speed or else you're going to have blurry um, images and, and some of the fascinating moving objects could for example be safari um, rally cars they tend to move very fast um, but it could also be something as simple as, as, as a kitten or someone walking so that is the other work that shutter speed does but there are also times that we want a low shutter speed for example if you're taking pictures of city cities at night if you're taking a picture of a city at night or general photos in the dark, you may need to have a prolonged um, exposure or a very slow shutter speed. Um, anything, you know, even beyond a minute for you to get some interesting night shots. So it is not always that we want to freeze objects. There are times when we also want um, to expose our objects longer. For example, when you're doing night photography. Another example of a time that shutter speed can also have some creative effects is when you're taking pictures of things like water. If you take a picture of a flowing river at different shutter speeds, you will see how the water looks different each time. Um, fast shutter speeds of a river show it looking like frozen ice. Slow shutter speeds of a river show it looking like a nice, smoky, smooth, milky um, liquid. So that also has some very interesting creative effects right there. When we talk about your aperture, again, apart from allowing light or reducing light, it also has some creative effects. Um, a wide aperture gives you what we call a bokeh effect or a shallow depth of field. And this is something that photographers and videographers will use a lot just to make the subject or the object um, stick out and sort of pop into the eyes of the viewer. So the larger the aperture, the shallower the depth of field. And the smaller the aperture, the deeper the depth of field. Now a shallow depth of field just means that you have um, a varying degree between what is in focus and what is not. And you can manipulate that very easily using your uh, shutter, your aperture. And a deep depth of field means that uh, quite a lot is actually in focus. Uh, photographs like those of landscapes, you, you would prefer to have your, a deep depth of field so that you can see everything in detail. So those are the other two creative uh, things that you get to get uh, when you're setting your aperture and your shutter speed. One of the important things about using a camera like this one is that you always have to remember to strap it into your neck. And this of course is to avoid any unnecessary accidents that could occur um, because of you either you know, tripping or dropping the camera. And that is the purpose of this strap 
on all professional cameras. It is there for a reason and it could cost you a lot of money uh, by saving your camera from falling onto the ground. So always make sure that you strap yourself. Um, and until next time, this has been Erika Denge. Goodbye.